Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India I welcome you to the sixth lecture of uh, this NPTEL MOOC course titled Psychology of Stress, Health and Wellbeing. So, this is the third lecture of module 2. So, today we will talk about uh, the stress and psychological disorders. So, before we talk about today's lecture, let us uh, have a brief recap of the last lecture. So, in the last two lectures, we are talking about how stress is connected to health and in that context, uh, we are talking about physical health and we have discussed in the lecture 4, how stress is connected to uh, non-infectious diseases and in the last lecture, we have discussed how stress is connected to infectious diseases. So, we have discussed uh, primarily that you know stress can influence infectious diseases uh, you know, primarily by affecting our immune system. So, in that context, we have discussed there is a whole branch of study called uh, psychoneuroimmunology, uh, which studies this relationship between psychological factors, neurological factors and immune system. And uh, most of this you know connection between you know mental factors and immune system is kind of studied under this branch of study. Now, we have discussed in the uh, cons in the under immune system, we have discussed that uh, immune system is primarily you know governed by uh, lymphocytes of WBC or white blood cells and it includes primarily B cells and T cells and most of the research uh, shows that you know uh, stress can influence our immune system and uh, uh, some of the recent meta-analysis showed that you know uh, that it also depends on what is the nature of stress. So, it was found that you know acute stress can enhance temporarily our immune system uh, by mobilizing our resources or at least or redistributing the immune cells in the body. However, chronic stress is the main culprit in terms of you know affecting our immune system and it deteriorates or suppresses all the immune functions. Then we have discussed the mechanisms between stress and immune system and primarily we have discussed you know there are two mechanisms. One is uh, the release of stress hormones, uh, particularly the cortisol, which is released under chronic stress, uh, suppresses uh, the diverse immune functions, or immune cells are suppressed, or or their function, uh, or either they are suppressed or they are not produced enough. Then the other other mechanisms that we have discussed is uh, behavioral pathways, uh, which was associated with basically, you know some of the behavioral changes that are associated with stress uh, include excessive drinking of alcohol, lack of exercise, sleep difficulties and all these can have further detrimental effect on our immune system. We have also discussed you know the implications of this research finding uh, primarily in the context of uh, understanding that if stress can you know suppress our immune system, then the interventions aimed at reducing stress such as relaxation or psychotherapies for enhancing mental and emotional well-being, all these should enhance our uh, immune functions. And many research actually indicates this is true in the sense that you know very recent meta-analysis of 56 studies involving intervention studies clearly showed that you know uh, that uh, psychotherapies such as you know cognitive behavior therapies are associated with enhanced immune functions and these are long lasting that it lasted uh, uh, no or it persisted 6 months after the intervention so therefore you know uh, the various stress management techniques
can enhance our immune function apart from facilitating uh, mental and emotional health. So, these are the some of the important concepts that we have discussed in the last lecture. Uh, today, we will uh, specifically talk about how stress is connected to psychological disorders or you know, how it impacts our mental health specifically. So, stress itself is not a illness or psychiatric diagnosis, but it can influence you know uh, our mental health and it can contribute to mental disorders. So, in this lecture, we will discuss some of the key concepts such as you know the relationship between stress and psychological disorders. We will we'll discuss in that context acute stress disorders, we will discuss PTSD or post traumatic stress disorder and we will also discuss complex PTSD. So, these are all connected to uh, stressful experiences in our life. So, the, the various research shares, shows that you know stress can contribute to the development of various psychological disorders. I know uh, such as you know depression, schizophrenia, anxiety disorders, eating disorders, post traumatic stress disorder. So, it can contribute to diverse you know mental health uh, uh, illnesses and disorders. So, since in by itself it is not a disorder, but it can always contribute to all these disorders. Uh, we will uh, so, basically how it basically you know uh, we have already seen that stress can very strongly influence how we think and feel and this uh, you know disturbances in the thinking and feeling can further contribute to various you know psychological disorders which may be manifested in terms of our thought processes and emotional issues. So, we will not be able to talk about all the psychological disorders that are you know, connected to stressful experiences because it is beyond the scope of this lecture. Uh, we will specifically talk about you know two disorders, one is called as acute stress disorder and another is called as uh, PTSD or post traumatic stress disorders. Now, in this context we should uh, you know understand uh, one difference between the conceptual difference between the term st stress and traumatic stress. When we talk about stress, it could be a very uh, you know, normal day to day you know experience also. For example, you, know, you are you know stuck in traffic jam, it could be a stressful experiences. But when we talk about trauma, it is very specifically it means you know very high intensity stressful experiences, uh, which can be life threatening, which overwhelms your capacity to cope. So, it kinds of you know makes you you know helpless and intense fear, horror, all these experiences are associated with traumatic stressful events. So, whenever we experience a trauma traumatic event such as you know uh, death of someone loved one or you know accidents. So, these are not just stressful experiences, these are highly traumatic experiences which can overwhelm our capacity to deal with it. So, we may not know what to do with it, we can just go numb uh, for some time and mostly people experience intense fear, helplessness and horror when they encounter traumatic events. So, we should make, uh, understand this you know the basic difference between when we say just stressful experiences and traumatic stress or traumatic stress traumatic events. So, well, let us start with the acute stress disorder. So, this is uh, obviously connected to the stressful encounter and particularly traumatic events. So, an encounter to a traumatic event can lead to acute stress disorder. Now, in acute stress disorder uh, is an intense unpleasant and dysfunctional reaction beginning uh, just after an overwhelming traumatic event, which can last generally it lasts less than one month. However, if symptom persist for more than one month, uh, it can be diagnosed as post traumatic stress disorder, which we will talk just after this. So, whenever we experience a traumatic event, 
which are very overwhelming you know unpleasant you know then uh, uh, the the not the general reaction that we exp uh, you know uh, or symptoms that we experience as a result of encounter to a traumatic event uh, can lead to uh, can be diagnosed as acute stress disorder if it persists for you know relatively longer time uh, but it is generally diagnosed as uh, acute stress disorder if it is kind of you know symptoms are shown uh, within one month if it is more than one month then it is you know generally diagnosed as ptsd So, according to the American Institute of Stress, uh, between 5 to 20 percent of people exposed to trauma uh, such as car accidents, assaults or witnessing a mass shooting, uh, generally they develop acute stress disorder and approximately half of such uh, people they develop PTSD. That means, their symptoms persist more than one month. Now, acute stress disorder was a kind of reclassified as trauma and stress related disorders in uh, diagnostic uh, DSM basically means a diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders, uh, which is basically you know uh, maintained and you know and uh, uh, evolution is primarily you know done by American Psychiatric Association. So, DSM 5 is the most recent one uh, which was introduced in 2013. And earlier, this uh, acute stress disorder and PTSD disorders were categorized under anxiety disorders. Uh, however, in DSM-5, uh, they are categorized separately under trauma and stress related disorders category. So, acute stress disorder is generally you know kind of psychiatric diagnosis uh, that may occur in patients after witnessing traumatic events such as you know or hearing about it or directly exposed to a traumatic event. Uh, so, it could be motor vehicle accidents, acts of violence, work related injuries, natural or man made disasters, sudden or unexpected bad news etcetera. Symptoms of acute stress disorder you know uh, uh, generally you know includes anxiety symptoms, intense fear or helplessness, uh, re-experiencing of the event, avoidance of the trauma related stimuli, uh, dissociative symptoms. So, all these symptoms we will discuss in more you know, in much more detail in PTSD which we will be discussing just after this. Uh, but one particular uh, symptom category called as you know dissociative symptoms are more you know pronounced under acute stress disorder. So, uh, dissociative symptoms primarily inclu include kind of exp uh, you know experiencing discontinuity or disconnection uh, between your thoughts, memories, your surrounding environments, your actions and identity. So, it could be you know you may feel like you are fragmented not a whole, um, you may feel detached you know there may be reduced awareness of the environment you may forget many aspects of your uh, traumatic events uh, which is a kind of natural mechanisms by which our mind tries to forget certain important aspect of you know traumatic events so that you don't have to remember it so it could be an unconscious mechanism so all these symptoms are there and we'll try to understand more detail about these symptoms in ptsd uh, because uh, these symptoms are also very common in ptsd also so, whenever we experience a stressful encounter, these are very common symptoms that uh, particularly traumatic events, uh, these symptoms are very common and uh, people uh, may develop acute stress disorder if they persist let us say you know let us say uh, for a month or 28 days uh, and uh, if it is resolved then it is kind of ends with acute stress disorder and if it is not resolved, uh, one may be diagnosed as post traumatic stress disorder. So, uh, persons with uh, acute stress disorder are at increased risk for developing PTSD uh, because basically you know most uh, the people you know with ASD actually develops many of them develops you know PTSD. 
uh, symptoms generally must be persistent present for minimum of 2 days, but not longer than 4 weeks or 28 days. Uh, patients with persistent symptoms may develop PTSD. Uh, symptoms of acute stress disorder typically peak in the days or weeks after the exposure to trauma, which is very natural. Uh, when we experience, you know, trauma, after the experience or encounter of the traumatic event, you know, generally our symptoms peaks, particularly in terms of our anxiety symptoms, re-experiencing symptoms, dissociative symptoms. And then slowly, slowly they gradually decrease over time. And if it is resolved within one month, then uh, you, know, you are just done with ASD. Now, we will talk about PTSD. Uh, many of you might have heard about PTSD because it is uh, quite you know discussed in medias and other uh, in the popular media. Uh, so, it is called as post traumatic stress disorder. So, after traumatic event, if you develop a disorder and particularly it is more long term persistent disorder, ASD is more short term reaction, PTSD is more long term reaction. So, uh, PTSD is a kind of you know mental disorder that may occur among people after experiencing or witnessing extremely stressful or traumatic events uh, such as war, disasters, accidents, rape, etc. PTSD has a very you know long history and uh, it has been named with many other names and uh, finally it became PTSD or post traumatic stress dis disorder. Uh, so, the whole diagnosis of or the concept of PTSD evolved out of war history or combat history, you know. Uh, it has many, his, you know, almost war, all big wars or world wars were associated with, you know, you know uh, the discussion or the understanding of the PTSD and it evolved out of all the war veterans. So, uh, let me briefly, you know, give you some of the historical perspective how PTSD evolved. So, during World War I, uh, the PTSD symptoms were actually shown by many soldiers, you know, when they returned after the war or during the war. Uh, at that time, it was known as shell shock, you know, symptoms, you know, uh, primarily because, you know, these symptoms were seen as a reaction to, uh, you know, repeated exposure to you know explosion of artillery shocks. So, as a, as a reaction to shocking experience of artillery you know shells, uh, people were it was understood that they were experiencing uh, certain you know disturbances in their mind. Many also called it as a war neurosis. Uh, at that time, there was not much understanding about uh, this, uh, you know, uh, and uh, many people were not even considering it as a disorder or, you know, problem. And uh, even many people, you know, considered it as a kind of sign of weakness that many soldiers are not mentally strong enough. So, that is why, you know, they are kind of shocked by war situations and it could, it was kind of seen as a symptoms of mental weakness also. So, many people also look at it like that also. So, there was not much understanding at that time and it was kind of seen as a reaction to, you know, artillery, you know, ex shocks to art artillery explosions and those kind of things. During World War II, uh, this shell shock was kind of renamed or replaced by combat stress reaction, another term was used. Uh, uh, also, people called it that as a battle fatigue. Uh, so, World War II also not much development has happened uh, during the World War II also. And at that time, treatment mostly included, you know, giving them rest, people who are showing those symptoms of mental disturbances or soldiers who are showing the symptoms of, you uh, know, uh, disturbances. They were given rest so that they could recover and, you know, they can come back to the war again. And they were given some uh, psychosocial support system, particularly the you know uh, support was given from their soldier units and other things. So mostly these type of things were done during uh, World War II. In uh, 1952, American Psychiatric Association first introduced uh, its DSM or Diagnostic or and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So they kind of 
the manual for mental disorder was first introduced that the first version DSM 1 in 1952, uh, where they did not include you know exact PTSD kind of uh, you know category, but they included something called as gross stress reaction, uh, which was proposed only uh, you know proposed for people who are relatively normal, uh, but when they experienced traumatic event certain symptoms they were showing. Uh, but it was kind of seen as automatically people will recover within few days. So, it was not typically seen as a kind of disorder. However, this diagnosis was removed in DSM-2 which was introduced in 1968 and they included something called as adjustment reaction to adult life again which was not exactly PTSD kind of uh, no, uh, category or uh, it was not, not much you know. Uh, helpful in terms of understanding this reaction of war veterans. It was in 1980 when American Psychiatric Association um, formally introduced a PTSD or post traumatic stress disorder in their DSM 3 or the third, uh, third revision of um, uh, no, DSM and it was introduced after a kind of you know result of many movements uh, which included you know, uh, you know war veteran movements particularly after Vietnam war many veterans were showing symptoms of PTSD. So, there was a kind of you know pressure and movement from the veteran side uh, there were many feminist movement uh, especially related to many you know sexual uh, you know assault survivors were also showing similar symptoms. Holocaust survivor advocacy group was also involved in it. So, because this symptom was shown by you know many Holocaust survivors also. So, it was not just uh, it was seen from the research that it was not just war veterans, but many other civilians are also uh, shown showing similar symptoms after traumatic events. So, because of all these outcomes of movement and the research finding from all these people, uh, it was finally introduced in 1980 uh, in the DSM-3 and this diagnosis evolved after that, uh, you know, then many revisions were done, uh, DSM-3, uh, then DSM-4, there was a revision in the PTSD diagnosis criteria and then uh, the finally the most latest one is DSM-5 where it was also some revisions was done in terms of uh, understanding the diagnosis criteria. Uh, so, based on the evolving research few things were changed in every revision. So, uh, serious attention to PTSD was given after the end of Vietnam war in 1975, which resulted in return of many psychologically disturbed US military veterans. Uh, some studies suggested that about half million of Vietnam uh, veterans were suf suffering from PTSD even after decades of end of the war. So, it was really very horrific situation for ve veterans. Uh, so, this kind of became a major source for uh, you know becoming or making it a formal diagnosis in the uh, DSM. So, then obviously, it was introduced in 1980 in the DSM 3 by American Psychiatric Association. <laughs> So, what are the criteria? So, we will see the most latest DSM-5 criteria how a person is diagnosed with PTSD. So, there are many criteria. So, we will just discuss you know, some of the broad, broad criteria that are introduced in DSM-5. So, one thing in DSM-5 they have a separate category called trauma and stress related disorder earlier uh, DSM-4 they were in uh, under anxiety disorders. So, PTSD first criteria is called criteria A which says a person wa was exposed to death, threatened death, actual or threatened serious injury or actual or threatened sexual violence in following ways at least one of the ways is required to be diagnosed as with PTSD. So, there has to be direct exposure, there can be a direct exposure or the person can witness a traumatic event 
happening in front of that in front of him or her or learning that a relative or a close friend was exposed to a trauma even learning about traumatic event from another person can also lead to ptsd or indirect exposure to aversive details of the trauma and in indirect exposure uh, usually in the course of professional duties for example by you know first line workers or medics when they are indirectly exposed uh, to such you know aversive details of a traumatic event such as for example dealing with accident victims or you know trauma victims so at least one of these ways of exposure is required to be diagnosed with ptsd so this is criterion a criterion b uh, says that traumatic event is persistently re-experienced so what happens in ptsd one of the major symptom is that re-experiencing of the symptom so you persistently re-experience the traumatic event that has happened so let's say after accident uh, it is not going out of your mind so cons continuously you are re-experiencing this traumatic event again and again in terms of or in the form of unwanted upsetting memories so memories are coming back again and again or you might might be you know having nightmares about those traumatic events you might have flashbacks about those traumatic events emotional distress after exposure to traumatic reminders physical reactivity after exposure to traumatic reminders so all these re-experiencing symptoms at least one of the ways uh, are, is there for uh, patients with PTSD symptoms. So people, it's kinds of unconsciously, automatically comes back to their mind again and again. Criterion C says avoidance of trauma related stimuli after the trauma in the following ways, at least one is required trauma related thoughts or feelings you try to avoid it trauma related reminders you try to avoid it now here is one uh, important thing to kind of understand is that uh, in the one hand the person is trying to avoid it consciously or unconsciously any reminder that comes to the mind or any stimuli from the environment associated with those traumatic event and on the other hand there is a constant re-experiencing so person is automatically re-experiencing those symptoms so what happens this is a kind of vicious circle the more you try to avoid something especially at the mental level the more it comes to your mind so this is a kind of paradoxical thing so this is called as thought suppression in psychology and uh, many research shows that the more you try to suppress your thought the more it actually it comes to your mind for example, you know, in the most of the thought suppression experiments, the participants are generally asked to suppress a thought. For example, they will be asked, uh, you can, re you can uh, you know, remember anything or you can think about anything, but do not think about pink elephant for the next one minute. So, this is let us say suggestion is given to you. So, for the next one minute, you can think anything, but do not think about pink elephants. And it was found very interestingly, all the participants were ending up only thinking about pink elephant, which was actually asked them to avoid. So why it is happening is primarily because uh, if you want to avoid something, first you need to remember it. So automatically it comes to your mind. So that is the problem. So this is a similar kind of thing is happening with the PTSD people. They are trying to avoid thoughts and memories of trauma related events but the more they try to avoid more kind of they re-experience it again and again criterion d uh, includes the negative thoughts or feelings that begin or worsened after the trauma so this was introduced in the dsm-5 earlier it, this criteria was not there so this is a new introduction in the dsm-5 negative thoughts or cognitions or feelings that actually starts after a traumatic event no? or it is worsened by the traumatic event uh, in terms of inability to recall key features of the trauma 
overly negative thoughts and assumptions about oneself or the wo world. So, a lot of negative thoughts about your own self and about the world in general. There can be exaggerated self blame or others for causing the trauma, uh, heightened negative emotions, decrease interest in activities, feeling isolated, difficulty in experiencing positive emotions. So, at least two of these symptoms are required for the diagnosis of PTSD. Criterion E says, you know, trauma related arousal or reactivity that began or worsened after the trauma. So, hyper arousal, you know, physiological reactivity increases, you know, you become highly aroused in terms of physiological reactivity. So, you become highly irritated or become aggressive, uh, one may tend to do more risky and destructive behavior. There is a hyper vigilance, small things can disturb you, small sounds from the environment can disturb you. There can be heightened startle reactions, uh, difficulty in concentration because you know of physiological reactivity whenever you are highly physiologically aroused, it is very difficult to pay attention or focus, uh, which also leads to difficulty in sleeping. So, this hyper arousal is also another thing that happens one of the core symptoms, at least two of these symptoms is commonly found among PTSD uh, or the people experiencing PTSD. Criterion F uh, which is required, it says the symptoms last for more than one month. So, because that is the difference between acute stress disorder and PTSD. If it is less than one month, then it can be called as acute stress disorder. But if it is more than one month, only then we can call it as a uh, post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis. Criterion G, which is also required, uh, which says symptoms create distress or dis or functional impairment. So this is also very important. Whenever we say something is disorder, the idea is that it is kind of influencing negatively your functioning also. So your day-to-day -day functionings, your occupational functioning, your social functionings are impaired. You are not able to perform them properly. So, that uh, that uh, functional impairment is also one of the important criteria to be called it as a disorder. Criterion H, uh, which is also required, which says uh, symptoms are not due to any other factors, any other factors uh, related to such as you know medication, substance use or other illnesses. So, some of these symptoms can be you know associated with some medication, some substance use or other illnesses. Uh, if it is not associated with the traumatic event, then we cannot call it as PTSD. So, these are important criteria that are proposed by you know uh, DSM-5 based on all the research, recent research findings uh, to diagnose somebody as uh, you know with PTSD. So, typically if you see you know there are uh, you know four clusters of symptoms in PTSD which are very important you know very briefly. You know, one is re experiencing re experiencing of the traumatic events. avoidance of trauma related stimuli hyper arousal in terms of physiological arousal and fourth one which was uh, introduced in dsm5 is negative thoughts and emotions. So, these are the four clusters of symptoms and uh, within each cluster there are 
you know, specific categories that we have discussed. So, these are very important, you know, criteria in terms of PTSD and these are uh, many people may experience these symptoms after traumatic event and it is very common, uh, but one may not be really, you know, uh, or, you know, experience a disorder. Uh, for disorder, we need all these specific, you know, criterias and it has to be persistent and uh, functional impairment, so many things. But these are common symptoms most of us will experience after a traumatic event, uh, which may not you know, become a disorder in most in many cases. So, this is uh, in nutshell the symptoms of PTSD. So, the symptoms of PTSD are very common as I have said uh, after the exposure to traumatic event, most of us will experience these symptoms. However, the majority of people do not develop clinical disorders. For clinical disorder, we need very specific diagnosis of each of these categories. So, according to American Psychiatric Association, you know, um, website, uh, they reported that approximately 3.5 percent of US adults experiences PTSD and 1 in 11 people is likely to be diagnosed with PTSD in their lifetime and women are twice as likely men to have PTSD. So, this percentage seems to be double in case of women uh, that PTSD is more likely to happen in, in case of women as compared to men. Uh, PTSD can occur to people of any ethnicity, nationality, culture and age. So, it is a kind of universal thing. It can be experienced by people of any culture, any, uh, you know, any nation, any age group. So, it is a very common that many other conditions may co-occur with PTSD. So, it is very commonly uh, reported or research have indicated that, you know, uh, many other comorbid disorders may happen or symptoms may happen with PTSD such as depression, anxiety, substance abuse. So, these are very commonly co-occurring symptoms, you know, they are comorbid symptoms. Now, PTSD can occur to children as well. So, we will look into little bit detail about the children aspect. So, it is not just that adult adults only experience PTSD. Uh, in some cases, PTSD symptoms may surface after many months or even years after the traumatic event. So, in some exceptional cases, it is possible that people are not immediately showing symptoms of PTSD because people may become numb for some time, you know, but uh, they may express their symptoms even after months and years. So, it is possible that symptoms may be repressed uh, initially, but it will be expressed later on. So, PTSD can be treated with psychotherapies and medication and uh, obviously, it is depending on the case to case basis. Uh, so, we will discuss in general about uh, uh, many strategies which are common to psychotherapies and uh, in terms of coping with the stress sections of the chapters that we will be discussing in the upcoming lectures. So, some of these things we will also cover. In general, we will talk about in terms of how to cope with the stress and trauma. So, we will talk about little bit about PTSD in the children. Now, traumatic events may be encountered by anybody including children. So, when children experience severe stress or trauma, uh, they may many times develop long term sim symptoms uh, which may persist for more than a month. Uh, so, many times they can be also diagnosed with PTSD. Studies indicate that children can develop PTSD after exposure to traumatic events such as violent crime, sexual abuse, natural disasters and war. So, these kinds of events when children are exposed to such kind of events or when they experience such kind of events. Uh, many children can develop PTSD. Now, diagnosis of PTSD in children is very complicated and very difficult uh, because, uh, you know, for many reasons. So, some of these reasons we will discuss. So, it is very difficult and complicated. So, for example, you know, uh, this Kaminer and his colleagues 2005 in one of the research article, they reported some of the reasons why it is so complicated. So, one reason is uh, PTSD criteria requires most of the criteria that we have discussed, you know, an adult can express it and say this is what is happening with me, I am re-experiencing